मेडिकल ऑनकोलॉजी सर्जिकल ऑनकोलॉजी यूरो ऑनकोलॉजी गायनेकोलॉजी कोनकोलॉजी रिसर्च साइंटिस्ट एकेडेमिशियंस एंड लाइफ साइंस प्रोफेशनल्स मेन फॉर रिसर्च एंड डेवलपमेंट इन द फील्ड ऑफ ऑनकोलॉजी इंटरनेशनल एसोसिएशन ऑफ ऑनकोलॉजी इज ऑर्गेनाइजिंग अ फ्री वेबिनार ऑन सर्जिकल टेक्निक्स इन वुमेन कैंसर ऑन 25th ऑफ अप्रैल 2021 बिटवीन 5:30 पीएम टू 7 पीएम so i request everyone to please participate in that particular webinar too and io regularly conducts all academic conferences webinars and related scientific events to increase awareness in the field of oncology and coming about our one more sponsor which is about biolix is a worldwide a non profit professional association which prominently promotes research and development We at Biolix have brought a revolution in the field of worldwide conferences. Biolix worldwide conferences brings together professional research and leaders who have explored all avenues to reinforce the field of life sciences and medical technology. Biolix worldwide conducts events worldwide which help in enhancing the skill set of the people from diverse industries and forms a common platform for eminent personalities, physicians, researchers, doctors, and academicians. professional business figures and much more biolix conference encourages better comprehensions about improvements and progressions over the world through worldwide conferences with the speed of science and technology so i would like to tell a few benefits of our webinar who all are participated uh, they just want to know if they want to know what the benefits that they have to get so here i am uh, they will get e certificates will be issued to all the participants IOU membership will be provided to all the participants till December twenty one. They can gain the knowledge about the current research and developments in gynecological cancer research. They can definitely spread awareness about the prevention, symptoms, early detection, and treatment of tumor cells associated with gynecological cancer. They can learn the causes of early stage and locally advanced breast cancer such as endo endocrine. disruptors environmental causes diet and lifestyle to find other ways to help prevent the disease they can identify new ways to prevent early stage and local advanced breast cancer and to help in early detection of breast cancer cells as well they can educate about the development of new ways to best evaluate the genes and proteins at work they can be under development of customized treatment plans for individual patients with breast cancer they can gain information regarding chemotherapy best surgery surgery methods radiation therapy scheduled targeted radiation therapy reconstruction surgery approaches approaches in fertility preserving methods and they can get to know the social and emotional factors that affect the treatment planning and quality of life of patients suffering from breast cancer 
So here we will start our session. This is about a small interview about our sponsors and the uh, people who are organized. So let's go into the session. So prior to that, let's start up with the topic with the welcome and context setting. Who will be the speaker as Dr. Ganesham Biswas? A few words about the Sir Professor Dr. Ganesham Biswas, who is a consultant medical oncology organizing secretary of Indo Oncology Summit 21. At an executive director as Fash Hospital Bhuneshwar Odisha. Sir is a consultant medical oncologist and executive director at Fash Hospital and Critical Care in Bhuneshwar. He is also visiting consultant for Kalinga Hospital Bhuneshwar. He has a special interest in leukemia, lymphomas, and epithelial ovarian cancer. Dr. Bishwas completed his undergraduate and postgraduate in Odisha. Then he moved to Mumbai to study and train for DM Super Specialty degree in Medical Oncology at Tata Memorial Hospital in 2005 and also qualified as a European Certified Medical Oncologist, PCMO. He is also a well-known name in the field of cancer treatment in Odisha and in the neighboring states. He has published a number of research papers in medical oncology which add feathers to his professional identity. So I would I, I would like to welcome our sir Dr. Anasham Biswas. Thank you, Sriniket. So please allow me to share my screen. Definitely, sir. Uh, just a minute. Yes, you can start sharing, sir. I hope my slides are visible. Absolutely, sir, it's visible. So thank you. Good evening, all. I hope everybody is uh, uh, safe. Good evening, sir. COVID pandemic. So uh, today is being uh, the organized by Astra and the BioLeaks. So we are talking about a chronic lymphatic leukemia, CLL, which may not be a common leukemia as our country is concerned as compared to the West. So let me have the context setting before we go into the topic proper. So like people, many of the states are into a lockdown, many of us are in quarantine, but that doesn't happen with cancer, So because cancer doesn't take a vacation. And every cancer physicians have seen in these last 15-16 months that those who have delayed their diagnosis, those who have delayed their treatment, and these patients have really suffered. Coming to the global cancer scenario, so from 2002, so we have moved into the 2020 global cancer data. The prevalence of cancer has moved from 25 million to 50 million, so almost doubling of cancer in last 18 years. Talking about the new cancer incidence, so we have moved from 10 million to 20 million. So that's again a doubling of new cancer cases in the globe. Talking about mortality, in spite of so much advancement in cancer biology and treatment. So from six and a half million to almost 10 million. Coming to CLL, oblique SLL, the background. So more than 21,000 estimated new cases in the United States in 2020 alone. And most common type of leukemia in adults in that country. So not in our country, in our country, it is a a high grade lymphoma that is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So median age at diagnosis is 70 years again in the US, but in our country, we see uh, probably uh, uh, one, one decade earlier. So we talk about SLL and CLL considered of the same B cell malignancy. In CLL, more than 5,000 clonal B cells in the peripheral blood, whereas in SLL, there is a presence of lymphadenopathy and or spinomegaly and less than 500 clonal B cells in the peripheral blood. If you take about the historical five-year survival, so two out of three are going to survive. So the range can be from few months to normal lifespan. So with the previous treatment that was like in the before the BTK uh, uh, inhibitors era, so the five-year survival was hovering around 80-85%. So this is the natural history 
so you will see uh, mutations happening at different time frame moving from chronic polyclonal lymphopoiesis to a low count monoclonal b lymphocytosis then high high count cll and then there is a relapse so the broad principles of cll treatment can be easily summarized in this slide if it is a low risk do not touch if it is a intermediate risk then do not treat except occasional symptomatic <laughs> if it is a high then you need to treat and occasionally you might get a symptomatic patient very high risk will be associated with lot of high risk features either a deletion 17p or a tp53 and this patient will require treatment and what we will be discussing whether chemotherapy whether chemoimmunotherapy or whether we are looking at a targeted therapy the cll treatment in the past has been wait and watch so monotherapy for those patient who present with the autoimmunological complications with the steroids alkylating agents purine analogs combination chemotherapies and the monoclonal antibodies prior or either anti cd20 rituximab or anti c52 is alentuzumab so the time lines of the progress since 1950s from we have moved from alkylating agents and then there is a combinations but we can see so only a few not even double figure responses in terms of a cr and then moved so the what happened was to the post 2006 when rituximab approval and now from there onwards we have a lot of uh, improvements in terms of molecules so what information do you require today in 2021 before you start a cll on treatment so we need to have this will be listening from our hematopathologist so i is the mutational status fish stimulated cytogenetics tp53 mutations and today in present era so we have uh, the newer groups like btk inhibitors ibrutinib and aclarotinib bcl2 inhibitors like the venetoclax monoclonal antibodies anti c20 we knew about rituximab now we are with obentuzumab and ofatumab and PI3K inhibitors are making a way like the idelisib and the dubilisib. So based on risk factors, so you do a fish, you do a IgB. So if it is a lower risk, then these patients can be a candidate for a chemoimmunotherapy. If they are high risk, then they are a candidate for a BTK inhibitors. So yeah. these are frontline options. We'll hear it from uh, Dr. Priyanka. So the BTK inhibitors today are the forerunners. We have. irreversible and the reversible so in the irreversible already we have in our hand ibrutinib and aclarotinib and reversible probably we look at in the future because those patients who are progressing or getting resistant to ibrutinib and aclarotinib so that is the way we look at so sometime back you can see the so last almost few years so that nsgm is flooded with all btk uh, inhibitors in uh, cll so the future of cll because the btk inhibitors we know that it has to be continued so we are looking at some finite treatment so can we end the treatment by at the end of one year or not so the some good news in covid 19 we have also heard in 2020 and now 2021 that btk inhibitors like ibrutinib and even the aclarotinib that has been showing some positive effects for covid 19 lung uh, involved so to end cancer incidence continue to rise from the globocan and cancer is personal the right patient the right treatment and also the right diagnosis and the right time so over to dr deepak mishra but uh, unfortunately he could not join so he has asked another colleague dr shushant who will be taking the uh, talk so passing the baton thank you so much thank you so much sir are you available uh, pentan so i'd like to proceed with the next uh, topic which is on how to i define high risk cll with pathological markers by dr sushant vinarkar small intro about dr sushant vinarkar uh, he is currently working uh, as a consultant at hematopathology and molecular pathology at tata medical center kolkata and he did his md in pathology from tata memorial center 
followed by fellowships in hematology. He has an experience of more than five years in molecular pathology, hematopology, and oncopathology. Interest in molecular genetics, especially on oncomolecular pathology, sequencing, and difficult case solving through genetics. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Sushan, sir. Am I audible? Sushansa request you to unmute. Good evening, Sushansa. Am I audible? Am I audible? Sushansa? Am I audible? Yes, absolute pleasure. You're audible now. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, is my slides visible? Am I slides yes. Visible? It's visible, sir. You can proceed. Okay. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. I'm Dr. Sushant Vinarkar. And uh, as Dr. Ghansham rightly pointed out, and in his slides, he showed that broadly, high risk and very high risk CLLs are the most important categories to be identified for treatment. I would just describe or define how high risk CLL can be identified with pathological markers. So diagnosis of CLL is pretty straightforward. It is based on blood counts, cellular morphology, and immunophenotyping. CPC shows leukocytosis with absolute lymphocytosis. The most important criteria for diagnosis of CLL is that there should be presence of more than 5,000 B lymphocytes per microliter in the peripheral blood. The peripheral blood smear shows classical morphology. It shows accumulation of lymphocytes with mature appearance and clumped chromatin, also called a soccer ball appearance of the chromatin. And there are numerous markers. Immunophenotyping is done for confirmation of the diagnosis of CLL. Once the classical CLL picture or morphology on peripheral blood is seen. CLL has a very classical diagnostic immunophenotype being a B cell natural lymphocytosis, CD19 is positive, there is dim expression of CD20, classically seen expression of CD5 along with CD23 and CD200. The classical expression of immunophenotype of CLL is dim CD20 with CD5 and CD23 expression. The closest differential diagnosis on immunophenotype of CLL is mantle cell lymphoma, which is differentiated by negativity of CD23 and negative expression of CD200. Mantle cell lymphoma also has a classical translocation, translocation 1114, which can be identified by PCR. So, classical models and staging systems in CLL have already been known since 1975 and 1981. The conventional staging system, Rai stage and Vedic stage, predominantly the clinical examination, which includes peripheral blood, lymph nodes, fever, spleen, bone marrow examination. These two staging systems are very widely used in clinical practice. However, they fail to discriminate amongst patients in early stage at diagnosis who will experience aggressive disease course. Over the period of time, other staging systems have evolved. The most recent being in 2016, which is CLL International Prognostication Index, also called as CLL IPI. This is now most widely used scoring system in clinical management. And it combines the clinical parameters as well as cytogenetic and molecular characteristics of the disease. The CLL IPI prognostication system includes five independent markers, which are deletion 17P or T53 mutation, unmutated IGHV gene, serum beta 2 microglobulin levels of more than 3.5 milligram per liter, and it also uses 
the information from the conventional staging system that is rice staged and the binet staging system and age more than 65. Each of these markers has been given points and based on that a cumulative score is calculated. The cumulative score of four to six indicates high risk, whereas a cumulative score of seven to 10 indicates very high risk. For the period of time, it has been known that by both conventional Bennett staging, rice staging, as well as the most recent CLL IPI staging system, that patients with high risk or very high risk have a very low overall survival rate. That is why it is in, very important to identify this high risk and very high risk patients at the early stage of the disease itself so that they can be further started on treatment. To identify the high risk category patients, various prognostic biomarkers have been evaluated from different categories in CLA. These are the serum biomarkers, the immunophenotypic markers, IgHV mutation status, chromosomal abnormalities, gene mutations, and also non-coding RNA, which are also called as microRNAs. The clinical, most of this have been evaluated and well studied in the literature. However, only few of them have been reported to have predictive values to guide clinical decision. Some of them which have gained clinical significance as predictive biomarkers in CLL over a period of time are deletion 17P, T53 mutation, Notch1 mutation, IGVH mutation status, complex karyotypes, and microRNAs. The genetic factors in CLLs along with their frequency and prognosis has been highlighted in this one slide itself. If you can see mutated IGHV has the highest frequency of 60% documented in CLL and this mutated IGHV has very good prognosis. Similarly, deletion 13Q, this is a cytogenetic abnormality which is seen at around 60% frequency in CLL, again having good prognosis. The unmutated IGVH, complex karyotypes, deletion 11q, notch 1 mutations, deletion 17p are known to have adverse prognosis. How are these genetic abrasions detected in CLL? And the most important genetic abrasions that will help to prognosticate the patients into high risk would be described in the further slides. The genetic aberrations are detected by complex karyotyping, FISH, and next generation sequencing methods. Complex karyotypes detect around 40% of cases in CLL show some abnormality. However, when FISH being a much more major sensitive technique, it shows around 80% cases of CLL having some or the other abnormality which can be used for prognostication. Newer methods of NGS have shown and array of mutations in different genes, which slowly and steadily are being studied in literature and in future would be helpful for prognostication. Coming to the most important gene in CLL, which is of very important prognostic value and indicates a very adverse prognosis, which is T53. Here in this picture, if you can see the green line, which is showing no T53 mutation or no C17P deletion, the patients of this category have a very high survival rate as compared to those who have either 17P deletion or T53 mutation. 17, the most common abnormalities that are seen in T53 in CLL are either the deletion of 17P, that is the short arm of chromosome 17, or a specific region of short arm of 17 chromosome, which has the T53 gene. The other abnormality is basically the mutation within the T53 gene itself. Amongst these abnormalities, the most common abnormality seen in CLL patient is presence of both these aberrations, that is one allele, the 17P, that is the short arm of 17 chromosome is deleted, whereas 
the other allele shows t53 mutation leading to deranged protein synthesis of t53 itself how do we test for the t53 abrasions the deletion of 17p that is the short arm of 17 chromosome is very well detected by fish studies whereas the t53 mutations are either detected by sanger sequencing or next generation sequencing sanger sequencing is a simple widely available method for t53 mutation it provides direct information of the mutation itself however it takes a relate its sensitivity is bit low it is around 10 to 20 percent and it has limited throughput the most important thing to be noted in t53 mutation analysis by sequencing either by sanger sequencing or next generation sequencing is start it should cover exons 4 to 10 of t53 which correspond to the dna binding domain of the t53 codons which is 100 to 300 as well as the 323 to 365 codons which are oligomerization domains these are the minimum requirement of the exons that need to be studied in t53 mutation analysis in cln sequencing of whole codon of the t53 that is exon 2 to 11 is highly recommended the report of the t53 mutation analysis should include the type of analysis the methodology used the exons analyzed the limit of detection and the coverage if next generation sequencing is the method that is used for analysis. Within T53 mutation, literature shows that increased complexity of cytogenetic abnormalities leads to further segregation of the patients. Over here, if you see the purple line, which has the lowest survival, has shown that the T53 gene is disrupted or mutated and along with that, there are more than five aberrations. More than five aberrations are also called as cytogenetic complexity, and they have emerged as prognostically adverse and independent biomarker in CLL itself. This cytogenic, this complex abnormalities can be studied by karyotyping itself. Coming to the second most important entity for prognostication of CLL. It is IGHV somatic hypermutation studies. Literature has shown that <laughs> somatic hypermutated patients of CLL have a better prognosis as compared to wild type or unmutated patients. Similarly, over here in this picture, you can see that the VH homology been less than 98%, which itself signifies that the IGVH region is mutated has a better overall survival as compared to those who have VH homology of more than 98%. This was in 1999 that IGHV mutation was noted. However, over the period of 20 years, multiple papers have been published and thus a consensus that somatic hypermutation status in IGHV, that is immunoglobulin heavy variable gene is an important cornerstone for accurate stratification and therapeutic decision in CLL patients. The commonly, IGHV somatic hypermutations are studied by conventional Sanger sequencing. However, recently there has been shift in practice of for using NGS for IGHV mutation analysis. Although it needs to be taken into consideration the financial situation wherein the NGS becomes a costly affair. So two methods for IGHV mutation analysis, Sanger sequencing, next generation sequencing. As I have already mentioned, NGS, the cons are it is relatively costly. It takes a longer turnaround time and it needs a dedicated bioinformatic person or bioinformatics tool for interpretation. Whether it is Sanger sequencing or next generation sequencing, the data analysis for IGHV sequence goes through IMGT database, which is a website that is present, which is formed by the ERIC group. Herein, the sequence of the IGHV is uploaded 
and then we get a result of the homology or the identity of the IGVH. When the identity is more than 98%, as you can see, see over here, it is 100%, it is said to be unmutated. A homology or identity less than 98%, then it is said to be mutated. This is how a sample report of IGHV mutation needs to be. We need to say how much is the identity and then we need to mention whether it is mutated, unmutated. This is as per the European Research Initiative in CLL guidelines. Another important aspect that needs to be mentioned is whether the gene rearrangement or the somatic hypermutation leads to a productive protein or unproductive protein. Few other markers which have evolved as important features in characterization of high-risk CLL on immunophenotype or flow cytometry, it is CD38. It is basically a transmembrane glycoprotein, which functions as receptor as well as enzyme. And it is surrogate marker for IGVH mutation status. Elevated expression of CD38, more than 30%, indicates and high risk cytogenetics presence, elevated beta 2 microglobulin, poor response to therapy, or shorter progression free survival and overall survival. Similarly, Another important immunophenotype marker, ZAP70, also indicates presence of high-risk CLL. It presence of more than 30% ZAP70 indicates a poor overall survival and progression-free survival. It's, it is strongly associated with high-risk CLL when interpreted with IGVH mutation status. Another marker which has been studied and which also indicates a favorable outcome when it is shown in low levels, that is less than 20% on flow cytometry CD49. The CD49 indirectly again indicates that if the expression of CD49 is more than 20%, the patient is going to behave on a high risk category. Few other molecular markers apart from T53 mutation and IGVH somatic hypermutations, which have been known to show or predict poor survival are NOTCH1. NOTCH1 mutated patients have rapid progressive disease and a significantly shorter survival probability. NOTCH1 mutations in CLL are mostly frame shifts or nonsense mutation, and they are clustered in hotspot in exon 34. The most common mutation is a two base pair deletion. Notch one mutated patients form a common subgroup of CLL with unmutated IGVH genes, harboring trisomy 12 as cytogenetic abnormalities. Similarly, another molecular marker which can be used for prediction of higher risk category is SF3B1 mutation. Newly diagnosed CLL patients harboring SF3B1 mutations are characterized by short survival probability. SF3B1 mutations are mostly missense mutation, and the most common mutation is K700E mutation, which is also the known or diagnosis mutation of MDS with ring sideroblast. The other codons which can show SF3B1 mutation are 662 codon, 666 codon, and 700, as known over here. SF3B1 mutations are associated with deletions of 11Q or ATM mutations and they cooperate in the CLL pathogenesis. Lastly, microRNAs or microRNAs are the most important features that are evolving and which are in research at present for prediction of the CLL. Few of the microRNAs that is MIR-155 have been reported as poor predictor of CLL. Similarly, microRNA 29A, 29B overexpression leads to an aggressive CLL. And one of the microRNA, which is characteristically associated with chemotherapy refractory diseases, microRNA 34A. This slide is the most recently published slide, which shows the extensive genetic heterogeneity of CLL. It shows that Within the mutational landscape of CLL, there are several mountains which are significantly recurrent genes and there are small hills. We can see over here, there are few of the mutations which would be surely coming up and indicative of prognostic in CLL. Few of them are ATM gene mutations or deletion 11Q, which is already known, 
on and the BRP3, BRP3 mutation, which is also present with deletion 11Q. So in future, few of these genes that have been enlisted over here, the mutations in these genes would be coming up as prognostication markers in CLL. The definition of high risk as per the NCCN guideline, based on DNA sequencing, the T53 mutated, IGVH unmutated, flow cytometrically, expression of CD38, ZAP70, CD49D, and on fish, deletion 11Q, deletion 17P, and presence of complex karyotype on karyotype. So these are the biomarkers that are used to classify the CL patients as high risk so that the treatment can be initiated in early stage itself. To summarize, deletion 17P, T53 mutation, deletion 11Q and unmutated IGVH status have a worse prognosis in CLL. Other markers which can be used are CD38, SAP70, Notch1 mutations, beta-2 microglobulin level and SF3G1 mutations, which again indicate high risk. And CLL IPI score, which is the most recently developed score, can be used to clinical, in clinical management to determine the prognosis of the patients. Currently, NCCN guidelines define the use of mutated T53, unmutated IGVH, deletion 17P, deletion 11Q, and complex karyotype as the prognostic markers for IRS CLL. With this, I will end my presentations and I would be happy to take if there are any questions. Thank, Thank you so much, Sushant, sir. Very valuable input. If any queries, delegates or participants can proceed with any of the queries. Okay. So I would like to proceed with the next topic, which will be on personalizing first-line treatment for patients with CLL by Dr. Priyanka Samal. A small intro about Dr. Priyanka Samal, who is she working as a professor and head of the department at the Department of Clinical Hematology, Hemato-Oncology and Stem Cell Transplant, IMS and SUM at IMS and SUM Hospital, Bhuvaneshwar, Odisha. She is currently working there, and she did her MBBS from SCB Medical College at Katak, and MD Pathology from VSS Medical College, Bulla, and DM at Clinical Hematology at IHTM NCH from Kolkata, completed in 2015. She got a training in bone marrow transplant training in CMC Velo at 2015, and she published totally 21 articles in national and international journal. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Priyanka Samal, ma'am. Yeah, am I audible and my slides are visible? Yes, ma'am, it's visible and you're audible. Thank you so much. Thank you, IAO, and uh, thank you, Nansyam, sir, uh, to uh, have to uh, participate in this uh, program of yours. It was a great learning. The first talk by Dr. Shushan was really informative regarding how we approach a case of CLL in this era, especially in 2021, when we are approaching for personalized medicine. And my topic, as you see over here, is personalization first-line treatment of patients with CLL. So previously, we have been talking about the uh, the like the way we practice evidence-based medicine, and now it is personalized medicine. To start up, what is personalized medicine? So precision medicine is a form of medicine that uses information about the person's genes, that is genomics, proteomics, and the microenvironment in which the disease occurs to prevent, diagnose, and treat the disease. In this era, actually, we are moving away from chemotherapy to reduce the side effects or the toxicities of the chemotherapy, make it more user-friendly so that the patients can be at home, have the therapy. The fear of cancer should go away like the way a patient has some diabetes medicines or the hypertensive, antihypertensives. He can take some oral form of drug or some subcutaneous form of injections, weekly or monthly injections to suffice or a daily oral, in, uh, oral, oral intake of the drug so that the patient does not fear cancer anymore and he is comfortable taking the drug at home 
without having the toxicities of these uh, chemotherapy. So we are advancing to that era and personalized medicine has helped us in the way like NGS is the technique uh, very well explained by Dr. Shushan how it has thrown light into the molecular aspects of the tumor and it not only contributes a better understanding of CLL but also identifies the subset of the diseases which have to be taken care in a different way, prognosticate in a different way. So the recent advances are in diagnosis, high resolution immunophenotyping flow cytometer has been the bread and butter of hematopaths or uh, in acute leukemias and chronic leukemias as well as in lymphomas. But then there are something new coming up like the high resolution immunophenotyping, prognosis by the biomarkers, response predictors like the division 17 p and P53. Treatment, why are we doing all these things is to have a proper treatment mm -hmm. approach to the patients. So, PCR signaling inhibitors, BCL2 antagonists, and recently the CAR T cells, which are the game changers, which have been predicted to be the game changers. Methods to evaluate MRD, the minimal measurable or the minimal residual disease, which constitute good examples of tools facilitating personalized management in patients with CLL. So, having said that, my experience in our institute. Since the time I have joined over here, 2017 till December 2020, we had, you can see the number of the patients here, CML, the most, 157, myeloma, 105, ALL, 120, AML, APML together, approximately 135, lymphoma, 78, and CLL is approximately 5.6% of the total lymphomas and leukemias over here, apart from the MDS or the NPS. So CLL, as uh, Dr. Ghanshyam already mentioned in his first slide, like the way we find in the Western literature, which comprises approximately 10% of all the malignant neoplasms, our incidence is relatively low. And why be because now we are able to pick it up because of the regular health checkup, the uh, people are coming up and consulting with us. So definition of high-risk CLL is important and has already been mentioned. Just to say, ESMO guidelines have tabulated this as personalized medicine synopsis where biomarkers like TP53 mutation, deletion 17P, IgHB and complex karyotype have been given a lot of importance to prognosticate a patient of CLL and uh, uh, stamp them as high-risk cases. So even though a patient has high risk features, but still there are indications to start therapy in a patient who is newly diagnosed as CLN or in a case of relapsed CLN. So these are progressive marrow failure indicated by lowering of HP less than 10, the platelet count less than 1 lakh, massive or progressive symptomatic splenomegaly, lymph node massive more than 10 centimeter, rapidly increasing lymphocytosis defined as an increase of 50% over a period of two months or a lymphocyte doubling time of less, less than six months, autoimmune complications, symptomatic extranodal involvement, like if he has heavy nodes in the abdomen and they are causing symptoms, constitutional symptoms we know as is defined as it has been defined for the lymphomas. So mentioned to here is that if a patient has a high risk molecular signature but still is not symptomatic, it still does not indicate that the patient should be started on therapy. But still a number of trials are now, now going on to see whether we can affect the overall survival or the PFS in the patients who have high risk CLL but without involvement of uh, any uh, symptoms. So. It is already mentioned how the genetic uh, features uh, or the signatures, they uh, uh, bring about the uh, difference in the PFS. Important over here is deletion 17P and PP53 mutations need to be understood by the newcomers or the postgraduate and the DMs uh, or the fellow students who are attending the webinar here. Even if the deletion 17P might be negative, we should go for a TP53 mutation analysis by Sanger or the NGS sequencing because it brings about an alteration in the PFS. Patients harboring these mutations definitely do much lower than the ones who do not harbor this mutation. Similarly, IGHV mutation status already discussed. This is the CLL International Prognostic Indication Score 
here you can see that uh, uh, age, clinical stage, and beta 2 microglobulin were there previously. The new additions to the table is the IGF mutation status and the TP53. T53, TP53 mutation carries a 4 plus 4 score. So the presence of this mutation is definitely puts the patient at a very high risk and a high risk where we have to treat the patient. So already mentioned, high risk, very high risk are the ones where we start therapy and even if the patient remains even if the patient remains uh, asymptomatic and has a high risk uh, uh, signature, we have to still wait when the patient is symptomatic. So uh, my uh, our talk is on the treatment nice patients of CLL and we start with the CLL 8 trial actually which was a major trial thinking about the uh, how the addition of anti-CD20 molecule that is rituximab brought about a major change in the progression free survival in the patients of CLL who were symptomatic and were allowed to undergo a chemotherapy or a chemoimmunotherapy regimen and as mentioned IGHD mutation uh, the mutated patients had a bit better PFS when they had uh, received the FCR, that is the triplet combination, which is known as the chemoimmunotherapy. And these were the patients who were fit patients to undergo chemotherapy, that is less than 65 years of age. Similarly, over here, we can see the probability of the overall survival. It was better in the FCR arm as compared to the FCR in the mutated as well as in the unmutated. However, the unmutated IGHD mutation group of uh, patients, they had almost, the, you can see the uh, curves here, they are almost not as much apart as it is seen in the mutated arm. So here they had an impression that the patients who were having unmutated IGHD did relatively poor whether it was FC or the FCR. So next in the era came, uh, as we discussed earlier, that uh, the presence of deletion 17P unmutated and 17P definitely influenced the PFS and the OS in patients of CLL, the treatment uh, nice CLL patients. And this is a 5.9 year follow up data which clearly shows how it has uh, been effective in these patients. Next came the CLL 10 trial. Here, FCR was uh, were compared with BR in untreated fit CLL patients without deletion 17 p This is important to see over here that these patients were selected who were not harboring the deletion 17 p IGHV status was independently associated with the high risk progression they have mentioned here. So what you can see over here, the green is the FCR IGHV mutated, which had the, and since they were all deletion 17P negative, this was the best PFS. Next was BR IGHV mutated, further low was FCR IGHV unmutated, and BR IGHV unmutated was in the lower, uh, the lowest mode, uh, lower most graph. So here we can see that FCR was better than BR in both the uh, mutated as well as in the unmutated arms. So then the next phase two GCLL SJ first line BR trial, they further published their data in the new CLL therapy regarding the progressive disease or the patients who had death during the study. So here again, you can see that in the patients who had 14 Q deletion, those people who did not have 17 P deletion were the ones who fared better than the ones or the and the worst to uh, fare with the 17, the ones with the 17 P deletion. None of the eight patients with deletion 17 P achieved a CR with pendamustine and rituximab, and the median PFS was only 7.9 months. So patients with high risk disease. Chemoimmunotherapy is not a uh, uh, is not a uh, option treatment option at present. But previously, when we did not have these oral BDK inhibitors or venipoclax and the other drugs, at that point of time, we did not have much with our in our hands, and BR was the only form of treatment which we could give for the treatment nine patients who were not suitable for the FCR regimen. Further updated PFS data by the IGHB status that was in the phase 3 trial where ibrutinib and rituximab was compared with FCR in patients who were less than equal to 70 years. That means 
proven eligible for the chemoimmunotherapy with previously untreated patients. Again, here you can see that the, in the unmutated arm, it had a better PFS, that is the uh, ibrutinib rituximab as compared to FCR had a better PFS, whereas in the mutated arm, it was the same. So patients who want to have a definite therapy, the problem with the ibrutinib rituximab arm was that there were six doses of six cycles of rituximab, whereas ibrutinib was to be continued for a uh, prolonged time till the disease progression or till toxicity is appeared. And here in the FCR, it is only six cycles. So it, it is based upon uh, how you counsel your patients regarding the toxicities, limited therapy, time, the treatment, the cost of therapy. And as you can see over here, the mutated, they fare both equally well. It is up to the patient's decision and the physician's choice to have which form of therapy for your patient. The next landmark study was the Alliance trial, where you can see there are three arms, ibrutinib, ibrutinib with rituximab and brindamustine rituximab. And here, the untreated patients who were more than equal to 65 years of age, that means chemoimmunotherapy ineligible. And the primary endpoint was PFS, crossover was allowed in this study. So similarly, we can see patients who had deletion 17P in both the ibrutinib as well as the ibrutinib uh, rituximab arm, it was better. Both of them almost the same, whereas we are fared poorly. So you can here also you can see the curves are almost in a similar fashion. So the point is there was no difference in ibrutinib plus rituximab or single agent ibrutinib. So we know that the cost of rituximab as well as ibrutinib both are high and if it does not bring about much of difference in the PFS or the OS in the patient having deletion, uh, have not having deletion 17P or having a deletion 17P, single agent ibrutinib is as good as ibrutinib plus rituximab. Next is the CLL14 trial where the PFS by the IGFB mutation and TP53 status was analyzed. And here first line, obinutuzumab, venetoclax, or chloramucil. Obinutuzumab, chloramucil in untreated CLL patients with coexisting medical conditions was examined. Here you can see that by the IGHP mutated patients fared equally well in both the arms, whereas if it was uh, IGHP unmutated, they did poorly. And TP53 status also, you can see over there that initially they fared well, but then there is some amount of separation of these curves. So, uh, important to say that TP53 muted, uh, TP53 mutated or IGHB unmutated, which are poor prognostic markers, are not suitable for chemoimmunotherapy, but more they uh, they respond to venetoclax, obinutuzumab, bufatumumab, and ibrutinib based therapy. So, next was the Illuminate trial where they have shown again uh, needing treatment more than equal to 65 years or less than 65 years with comorbidities. Ibrutinib single agent along with obinutuzumab or chloramducin obinutuzumab. Crossover again over here was allowed if the patient could not tolerate or had a progression of disease with chloramducin obinutuzumab. Primary endpoint was PFS which was uh, reviewed by the uh, committee and then the secondary endpoints, PFS in high risk patients, overall response and survival. So here also you can see that ibrutinib obinutuzumab had a better PFS than chloramidocin obinutuzumab. However, the overall survival important to see is that overall survival remained the same. So in spite of having a better PFS, OS did not change whether we split the patient's ibrutinib or chloramidocin, just like the way ASCT is able to prolong the PFS in myeloma patients, but the OS remains the same. So next was the Resonate 2 study design, where ibrutinib as a single agent was compared with chloramidocin. And again, over here, you can see that the PFS was much, much better in ibrutinib as compared with chloramidocin. And especially for the patients with unmutated IGHP, the PFS was better. And that was, uh, and that led to the approval of ibrutinib in patients with ITHP mutations and then upfront therapy. So PFS at 60 months, again you can see a large separation of the two curves, ibrutinib 70%, whereas chloramidocin 
only 12%. No significant PFS difference between the unmutated versus mutated. So, uh, this means that ibrutinib works equally well in whether, uh, irrespective of the mutation status of the IgA3. So, 5-year OS was again similar, already said about that. So, uh, with the median follow-up of 5 years, overall response rate 92% with ibrutinib versus chlorambucil only 37%. Well-tolerable drug, oral drug, similar to the way we are giving chlorambucil in elderly patients. CR rate is 30% after a median follow-up of 5 years. Overall response rate and CR rates with high-risk features were also very good when patients were treated with ibrutinib. So now the buzz in the town is regarding the acalabrutinib. The, uh, this is the second generation one, but both uh, ibrutinib as well as acalabrutinib are irreversible BTK inhibitors. As Dr. Ghansham already mentioned, we have some reversible ones to reduce the toxicities of these uh, uh, first and second generation BTKIs, but yet to have phase three trials, the data to come up. And elevate T, and this was its treatment name, acalabrutinib was uh, actually approved after this trial, plus midazobinutuzumab in treatment knife patients. Here you can see that acalabrutinib and obinutuzumab, the patients fared well even with the uh, uh, combination as well as the monotherapy and as a result of which similar to iprotinib plus rituximab, acalabrutinib plus opinitosumab does as well as single agent iprotinib and single agent acalabrutinib. So a single agent is as good as the double therapy. So PFS in patients with deletion 17p was better and here uh, this was the trial design over here, acalabrutinib plus obinutuzumab. This is to be given 100 milligram DID and obinutuzumab is 1000 milligram on day 1, 2, 8 and 15 of cycle 2. In first cycle, it is in escalated doses of 100 and 900. And acalabrutinib single and then it is the obinutuzumab and the chlorambucil. So here, as we discussed, at 24 months, the independent review committee assess the progression free survival and you can see the response rate is very good 93 percent 87 percent almost the same p value may not be significant in these two but then with gazaiva and chloram they say it was only 47 percent so they have assessed the response here the calaprotinib and the obinutosoma the response was 81 percent uh, you can see the partial response complete response is 23 percent and acalabrutinib single agent almost the same with less amount of complete response. And then this was the gazaiba and the chlorambucinol, which was still low. Overall survival, no difference. So uh, we saw how there was a PFS benefit. So after looking at the uh, trials which led to the FDA approval of these drugs, what are the guidelines? And uh, this is the 2021 update of the NCCN for the treatment nine patients without deletion 17P. You can see the frail patient with significant comorbidity or patients more than equal to 65 years, acalabrutinib plus minus obinutuzumab, single agent ibrutinib, venetoclax plus uh, obinutuzumab. These are the preferred first line therapy, and we have the chemoimmunotherapy over here. For less than 65 years without significant comorbidities, preferred regimen again acalabrutinib plus minus obinutuzumab, iprotinib, then plus obinutuzumab. Uh, the advantage of this regimen is that it is for a, a definite period and the other regimens remain the same. So once with deletion 17p53, first line is the acalabrutinib, iprotinib, obinutuzumab and phenytoclax and other recommended are alemtuzumab. So next is the ESMO guidelines, 2020 update, early stage CLL with symptoms or advanced stage CLL. As I said, symptomatic early stage is also an indication for, to, for treatment. IGHV unmutated, no PP53. Fit patients, ibrutinib, you can see over here, chemotherapy is still an option for these patients with CRHMN. Unfit patients, you go for acalabrutinib, venetoclax, ibrutinib, or uh, we can go with the low dose chemoimmunotherapy. IgH we mutated and low PP53. Fit patients, first line FCR, then ibrutinib. Unfit patients, then obinutuzumab, ibrutinib. 
TP53 mutated all patients or the Asian 17 is they are not candidates for CIP. So chemotherapy, this is my reference and it's a very good article uh, from ASH 2020. Chemotherapy free frontline therapy for CLL. They have beautifully again summarized it. It is almost the same as that of a small guideline. These are the trials, as I said, the, uh, these uh, number of trials in the phase three are going on to look at the duration and the overall response rate of these drugs. Selected phase three trials for FDA approved frontline regimens for fit patients, FCR, BR, IR, and FCR again over here. You can compare and uh, see the data. Selected ongoing phase two clinical trials for frontline chemotherapy free regimen, then plus ibrutinib, then ibrutinib and obinutuzumab, acalabrutinib and obinutuzumab, and xanobrutinib. Xanu is also an irreversible inhibitor. It is not a reversible BDKI. Important since we have Dragontinus inhibitor, generics are also available in, uh, in the Indian market and approved here. So we have to manage the toxicities. Important to list is atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmias, bleeding risk, infections, hypertension, diarrhea, fatigue, arthralgia, myalgia, cytopenias, some dermatological manifestations, headache, especially with acalabrutinib. So you can go through this. This is again uh, taken from the ASH 2020. So to summarize, with the advent of newer diagnostic advances, management of diseases are shifting to personalized medicine. Introduction of NGS has helped us to identify the molecules or the genetic defect centers, prioritize our uh, way of treating the patients. Deletion 17P or TP53 mutation is a high risk as per the IWCLL criteria. And uh, these are the ones which carry unfavorable prognostic indications and chemotherapy is not effective. This is very important and this is the basis of how we start therapy and select therapy for our patients of CLL. Deletion 11Q and unmutated IgHB are considered unfavorable. Newer novel therapies like PTK inhibitors as well as BCL2 inhibitors are coming up as the current standard first-line therapy in high-risk CLN. And this is the recommendation summarizing the SMO and the NCCN guidelines of 2020 and 21. Thank you for the patient here. Thank you so much, Ms. Priyanka, ma'am, for your most precious information given to us. We are really glad to get the information from you. And we are going to the next topic, which will be with the case that case based panel discussion by all the doctors, Dr. Ganesham Biswas, Dr. Priyanka Samal, Dr. Soumya Surat Panda, and Dr. Kutish Patra. So prior to going to that, I would like to give a small intro about uh, Dr. Soumya Saurat Panda, who is currently working as an oncologist at the Institute of Medical Sciences and SUM and SVM Hospital at Bhuneshwar and plays an instrumental role at the hospital. He completed his MBBS from SCB Medical College, Katak in 2005. He further did his M MD in medicine from SCB Medical College, Katak in the year 2010, followed by his DM in oncology in the Cancer Institute at Chennai. Dr. Uh, Soumya specializes in oncology and is adept at handling treatments, thyroidectomy, thyroid swelling, stomach and gastric cancer treatment, mastectomy, or Spiegel cancer treatment and splenectomy. And coming about our one more doctor, uh, who is Dr. Pritish Patra. He is currently working at the Department of Hematology at IMS and SUM Hospital, Bonesha. Pritish does research in hematology. His topics of interest are thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, thrombosis and hematosis, leukemia, lymphoma, lymphoma and multiple myeloma. He did his BBS at SCB Medical College, Patak, DM in Clinical Hematology at NRS Medical College, Kolkata. Thank you so much for participating, everyone. I request uh, to proceed with the case based panel discussion. Thank you, Sri. So, um, uh, is my slide visible? Yes, sir. It's visible. You can proceed. Yeah, since, since Dr. Deepak Mishra is not there, so I'll request Dr. Sushant if he's there. Uh, so be in the panel. Dr. Sushant is there or he left? Uh, no, sir, he left, sir. Okay. 
we, we you can proceed, sir. So first case is 62 year old retired army officer, otherwise healthy male, no known comorbidities, runs marathon, axial impanopathy, it is a BCLL, deletion 11Q, deletion 17P is negative, hemoglobin 14, PLC of 22,000, platelet of 1.8 lakhs, IGHB status unknown. So starting from Pritesh, uh, hello, so what, what, more, what more information you require? Sir, at this point of time, after we confirm the diagnosis mm -hmm. and uh, after it's diagnosed as CLL, then uh, the patient, this type of patient should be kept on wait and watch. The other status regarding the IGHB mutation, PP53 deletion or uh, these things are not required at this point of time because if the patient does not have the clinical uh, indications for treatment, these uh, things will not going to help now. Okay. So at this point of time, wait and watch. So deletion 11Q is there, asomia? Yeah, so deletion 11Q is a poor prognostic marker. Right. Uh, if you try to be a deletion 17P or T50, definitely an indication to urgently start treatment. Mm -hmm. So this one 11Q uh, is still a poor prognosis marker. So it, uh, if the axillary lymphadenopathy or some uh, other fatigue or some other symptoms are there, then I'll start, consider to start therapy. Yeah, Priyanka. So with the same thing, so now deletion 11Q is there, so which is a poor prognosis. So should we start on treatment or we'll wait for some symptoms or other markers to see? Yes, Priyanka? Yes, sir. Just a minute. As I already mentioned, sir, according to the International Working Group of CLL, they have clearly mentioned what are the indications to start therapy. Presence of deletion 11Q does not make it an indication to start therapy at the present. Okay. So we need to wait for the patient. If axillary lymphadenopathy is bulky or other symptoms are there, then only we have to further proceed to see whether IgH is mutated, is mutated or unmutated. So now, so uh, so would you consider performing the, the IgV status and the T53? Not at present. Not at present. So now the, this patient is symptomatic and See, he requires some sort of treatment. So now, would you consider doing this additional test, IHB and the, and the T53? No? So the question is for me. Okay. So, Pritish, for young and fit patients, would you prefer a finite therapy or, or an indefinite therapy? So, so this 62-year gentleman uh, an army officer, so now he's symptomatic. So he was on follow up with you for last two years or so. So now uh, there is a, is a lowering of hemoglobin, lowering of platelets. He has now systemic symptoms. And yes, sir. You, so now, so you, you can tell me, so, so would, you, would you prefer a finite therapy or, or an indefinite therapy? With a, a, sir, first of all, if this patient develops symptoms uh, which indicates the starting uh, the therapy, then at this point of time, we should do the mutation status, right. like IGSV mutation and TPP mutation or 17P deletion, because these have the uh, very huge impact on the therapy we are going to plan. If the patient have a mutation of IGSV or TPP, then definitely I will be going for a ibrutinib based therapy. But whether so this, this patient was deletion 17 being negative, so so after sir, this sir, at the, you are going to sir, going at to the time it? of sir at the time of diagnosis, the patient was deletion 17 being negative, but as the disease progresses, this status may change. The, sir, we should also remember that the deletion 17 P status is uh, uh, is uh, changeable, but the IGSB mutation status usually remains the same. Uh, at the uh, if at the point of the diagnosis it was uh, unmutated, then even after the disease progress, it remains the same. So yeah, at least yeah, the seven days. Yeah, with Pitish. Yes, sir. Important is first of all at the outset when the patient was not symptomatic, I would not even do a deletion seventeen p. Whenever there is initiation of therapy, we should do it. 
Second, if deletion 17B is negative, look for the mutation of uh, TB53. Third is IGHV mutation. It is uh, correctly said that it is never, it does not change. Whether you do it at the first point or you do it subsequently, it will not change. But if you, if deletion 17B or TP53 is unmutated previously, at any point of time you are initiating a therapy, you have to do it. Right. So the second scenario is a uh, elderly with a treatment nave CLL. So cervical lymphadenopathy with, with some comorbidities like hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, and a BPH for, his, for which he is on medication. Extensive bulky nodes in the neck, axilla, and groin. You can see a WBC counts of around 90,000, 90% lymphocytes. Hemoglobin are less than 12.5. Platelets just hovering around 1 lakh. Flow cytometry confirms CLL diagnosis. Marrow is 70% replaced with CLL. CT scan reveals a widespread adenopathy. And fish test reveals a deletion 11Q. And here, IGHB is unmutated. So, Somia, so any additional test you want to do or additional information for this patient? So this patient uh, is a 74 year old and he has got a comorbids, but he has got extensive uh, bulky lymph nodes in uh, axilla and neck and also the CT scan is revealing that 12 centimeter mass is there. And uh, so I, I would like to consider this patient for a treatment. Regarding the investigation part, PET scan is not always necessary. CT scan is also again optional. And EGM is clearly given out which are the tests to be done at baseline and which are preferable in trials. So in trial setting, yes, CT scan and uh, upfront Bone marrow is uh, required, but in uh, uh, patients who are in clinical practice, uh, bone marrow is uh, always not mandatory. So I don't. I am going for an extra test for in these patients. Okay. So any inputs from extra from Priyanka or Pitish? Sir, uh, I would say that since the largest node is twelve centimeter, we should also look at from this side whether there is any uh, transformation, vector transformation yes, is there or not. This is a 74 year old male. We need to look at whether the patient is just having a CLL or there are some sites of transformation in this patient. Okay. So, you know, LDH, so, uric acid, and PET CT scan will also help in this. Absolutely. Case. So, the uric acid here is a 9, and the LDH was something around 540. So, so which would, yeah, which would be your treatment of choice for this uh, treatment name CLL elderly with comorbidities? So, so would you would you uh, have this uh, deletion 17p and the t53 so sir, with that high ldh and high uric acid and such a large lymph node uh, okay. if we should all, uh, have to exclude the rictor transformation as madam has said mm -hmm. so we should go for a biopsy and to establish uh, the high grade transformation which will decide the treatment fit whether we will go with the cla treatment or we have to go with the any high risk lymphoma so Somia, no. so now the biopsy was done. So as as per Priyanka and Piti, so there is no rictus transformation. So you have managed with supportive care initially. So now how do you proceed with the treatment for this patient? So the biopsy is a rictus transformation? No, no, no rictus transformation. No, no rictus transformation. So in this case, a uh, patient, uh, we, we must be, we, the patient is having a high uric acid and he has got uh, bulky lymph nodes. So we must understand that there are some uh, treatment we should be avoiding. He's 70 year old. So probably I'll be avoiding a chemotherapy. I'll be avoiding FCR and bendamustinituximab. I'll also be avoiding a venetoclax in view of a high chance of TLS. And he has got a bulky lymph nodes. So, uh, so probably I'll be going for a BTK inhibitor in this setting. And also he's got a, it is an 11 view. So I'll be going with a, a BTK inhibitor, preferably if it is available, then acalabrutinib or else ibrutinib. So Priyanka, so only BTK or BTK with combination? No, sir, no combination. Single agent proton kinase. It is? Yes, sir. The, the, as discussed in the previous sessions, the addition of rituximab to ibrutinib does not give us any benefit of OS and PFS, mm -hmm. uh, even uh, with acalabrutinib or with ibrutinib. So I will be going with a single agent BTK inhibitors in this session. So I will ask one question. So like, like in solid tumors, so in liquid tumors, 
so you are talking about clm btk inhibitors so anti cd20 bcl2 inhibitors such a costly drug so you see many of these trials have ended up with a good pfs but not not a good ways so so really it doesn't matter in liquid tumors and if you are talking about a cln and such a costly treatment prolonged treatment continuous treatment priyanka so so what is your take on that see there is no difference in os but pfs is good even the progression free survival there is a wide gap between toramcil and uh, uh, single agent toramcil and rutun kinase inhibitors now that it is available at a affordable drugs there are generic available which are 10000 per month cost and there are no toxicities you do not have to monitor the tlc count patient's tolerability is good if the patient does not have an underlying heart disease it is absolutely safe and fine we have patients on proton kinase inhibitors which have been very tolerable so i do not find any uh, and uh, then with fluorambucil 74 years and all there are chances of having secondary cancers i would definitely prefer to go ahead with the proton kinase inhibitor beautiful response patients have vitesh so what yes, is your Yes, I'm. Uh, I agree with uh, what Priyanka said. I will go with uh, a bruton kinase inhibitor, preferably ibrutinib. Yes, so, what are the what are the additional measures you want to take? So, so since there are many students in the forum, so while so while starting on any of the BTK inhibitors, and especially ibrutinib. Sir, yes, we have to exclude the cardiovascular risk factors. Actually, there are chances of newer onset hypertension, arterial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmia. Sir. so before starting this we have to exclude uh, if uh, is patient uh, have any pre existing arrhythmias or if patient is having any uh, disorders which uh, make him more prone to uh, bleeding risk so somia any any absolute or or, or relative contraindications for the btk inhibitors if we are talking about ibrutinib yeah, so patient if they are on double antiplatelet agents and uh, patients are having uh, bleeding disorders And patient got hepatitis infection, so also we need to screen the hepatitis part. And uh, uh, and patient who are having a pre-existing atrial fibrillation and cardiac probably I will be avoiding. So in those patients, uh, so where uh, there is a relative contraindication, so Priyanka, so if uh, money is not a problem, so should we shift over to the second generation BTK inhibitors? Uh, yes, sir. Regarding hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and ventricular arrhythmias, which were one of the grave uh, uh, consequences of the cibrutinib, even in the real world scenario, the data which they had put up in the trials were relatively much less because they had taken the patients who were not having these comorbidities. But in real world data, the uh, incidence of these uh, uh, cardiac abnormalities was approximately 16 to 20 percent, which was quite significant. So to overcome these, because the bruton kinase inhibitor, the uh, ibrutinib is number of other inhibitor also uh, it kinases also it inhibits. Relatively, acalabrutinib has much fewer side effects, and they are the ones which is to be preferred if the patients have these comorbidities. But definitely, cost is an issue. But I think they are coming up with a lot of patient assistance also. Right. But does FDA recommend the use of acalabrutinib in frontline setting? Yes, it has now come up. Elevate a PM trial has only uh, resulted in the first. It was always a drug comes in the relapsed refractory setting. Once it is gone through that FDA, then it comes to the first uh, first line therapy. That was the ascent trial. Ascent, ascent. Then we have moved to. So Priti, so 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 what is your so once you have started a patient on a sub eighty eight thousand counts, and this patient has been started on four twenty milligram of ibrutinib. So what what are the Additional problems you have seen. We have seen the patients coming with the higher counts in next 15 days, next month, and the patients have uh, increased symptoms. The, the, the higher count in the next few days of starting ibrutinib is a common issue, but we have to uh, inform the patient that uh, even if it's going to happen, they don't have to panic because it is not going to uh, it is not going to uh, change the uh, result. Mm -hmm. and uh, it is not going to make any symptoms of tls and so nothing to worry so it's because only the trans due to the translocation of the lymphocytes from the lymph nodes into the circulation and uh, nothing to uh, we have to inform that this patients need not to worry it's only uh, shows that the drug is working chalo good 
so the third scenario is a 70 year male bcll out of station patients so hemoglobin 10 tlc around 50000 platelet less than a lakh lymphadenopathy fish trisomy 12 comorbidity is a history of uh, cabg hypertension dyslipidemia started on chemo immunotherapy visits one year later with clinically meaningful improvement in the meantime he has visited other hematologists and now has a fish report showing deletion 17 uh, there so i want to ask so so every patient who comes to you uh, is symptomatic and needs treatment so there can be two groups so one one group can afford something and the other patient can afford any, any, anything in this world so do you want to investigate them differently in terms of molecular in terms of ngs priyanka yeah yes sir uh, there is a great role especially as we discussed for cll the options available depends upon what is the status of his tp53 or deletion 17p and the igh if affordability is not an issue we should try we should give it not try it out we should give it because that is what will decide the patient therapy and uh, prognosticate how the patient is going to behave even i would say that though ibrutinib works well than chemo immunotherapy but patients with tp53 fair poorly than those than the ones who do not have tp53 right so this is equally important yeah pratish so this patient was started on chemo immunotherapy so before before the generics were available so priyanka and you will agree that so most of these patients were on pr regimen right so this patient came to you after a year so she is doing well now so the patient was being treated by me uh, so went to uh, somia he did uh, deletion 17 which came positive <laughs> so now so how do you manage this patient so would you start btk immediately or wait and watch until somia sir is it question to me or somia somia yeah so the patient uh, just because that he has got a report of a um uh, deletion 17 i, I mean so i am patient i will keep a close watch because he is 74 and with the uh, comorbidities so if patient is or not having any other symptoms then i'll keep a close watch and then i will consider a early start of treatment uh, at the moment of uh, patient having symptoms right so pritish so who are the patients today so in the times of generic available so priyanka said 10000 but i i understand is it around 20000 22000 per month hetero has come up with the least one 10000 per month is 420 420 yes then so this is a news for me then so uh, pritish then so who are the patients uh, who can still be on a br regimen today who are the patients uh, if uh, the patient is uh, fit uh, for receiving chemotherapy uh, less than 65 year old and without deletion 17p or uh, without uh, and with a mutated igsd status and uh, preferably uh, uh, not with 11k uh, deletion i will i can give them this option of br so somia so now with the evolving data of, of the bt clinicals so so do you think that br is almost out out of the on the schedule of the, of the armamentarium of cs cll yeah i i i mean so it depends who we explain to the patient there are two things are there one is that br has got a definite treatment and ibrutinib or bt clinicals has got a indefinite treatment so patients so who do not wish to have a continue treatment Uh, like a bit like btk inhibitors in such patients patients not willing to go on for that uh, particular treatment patients who are having a contraindications with bleeding episodes or to uh, to btk inhibitors or a atrial fibrillation only those patients otherwise the uh, role of br has diminished a lot so priyanka at times you see there are patients of cll unfortunately diagnosed in less than a 50 years a uh, symptomatic so how do you approach this patient so you have done all all the the fancy tests that are available today and you find that they are unfavorable so how do you counsel and how do you uh, plan your treatment for these patients and unfavorable young patients even if we start them on ibrutinib 
or venetoclax and uh, venetoclax or venetozumab still they have a high risk because the period they have still further is approximately 20 to 30 years if he is a 45 or 50 year male he is going to live for another 20 years so during that period of time he may progress at some point and then he may not be a candidate for any other therapy because now idelalisib and a number of other things are also coming up but then there is a role of allo transplant in these patients also yes. at any point of time a young patient having unfavorable factors on ibrutinib or venetoclax based therapy they are going to pre- progress at any point of time so we should also give them uh, 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 counsel them regarding the option of allo sdk to have a definite cure of this disease so priti so in the time so when we are talking about of large number of btk inhibitors irreversible reversible so so when do you actually counsel the patient for a transplant sir particularly uh, this type of patient very young patient uh, with uh, high risk factors like uh, deletion 17 p to p mutation or unmutated igsv status uh, in those patients actually uh, even we start treatment with an ibrutinib or any other BTK inhibitor, these patients should be counseled from the very beginning that on the long run, they may have their chances, the high chances that the disease will reappear and progress. So, and at least about that point of time, they should be uh, uh, treated uh, with uh, cellular therapy like allogenic stem cell transplant, though in other countries, uh, the other options are available like CAR T cell therapy. But in our setup, in our country, at least we can counsel them for allogen stem cell transplant. You know, and till then, we can use other agents if it present relapses on ibrutinib like venetoclax with or without rituximab. But ultimately, they should be transplanted if this patient, uh, in this young patient specifically. Right. So this is a setting of a relapse CLL. So a patient of 70 years diagnosed, uh, had symptoms, received six cycles of BR, did well for few years. So, so was doing well for last few years. So by this time, he has turned out to be 80 years. Again, symptoms have appeared. So uh, Priyanka, so, uh, so how do you evaluate this patient again? So you start from scratch and again, counsel, or how do you uh, how do you treat such patients? The relapse at any point of time has to be evaluated in the same way as a treatment naive patient. You have to prognosticate based upon whatever the tests are available and affordability of the patients. But mutation status definitely are important, and you have to look at the symptoms. Till the patient is having symptoms, not having symptoms, you can wait and watch. Once the symptoms appear or the hemoglobin falls or the platelets fall, treat as per a treatment naive patient. And since he is actually more than eight years, he has been off treatment and the disease has been, uh, the patient has been disease free for eight years. The thing he had received during his first treatment may also be an equally good option. But since the patient is 80 years of age, he would definitely prefer to take some oral therapy so that he can take it at home. So my, that is the only well, that is the only cause why I would like to start on BTKI. Otherwise, if he had a very good response for till uh, for eight years, the previous regimen would be equally good. Yes, yeah, Somya. So, so what are the other factors which will influence your choice of therapy besides what Priyanka has said? Uh, so, any relapsed patient, we have to be care- very careful that whether the patient is having a research transformation. And second thing is that we can we always repeat a, to look at the TP53. So a patient might develop a TP53. So you have to be careful about that part. Then we have to look at what is the previous drug that has been patient has been exposed to. So whether the patient has been exposed to ibrutinib or not. If not, then ibrutinib is always an option. And if yes, then venetoclax and rituximab yeah. is an option. Then again, we have to look at the tempo of the disease and also the age of the patient. Uh, whether it is less than three years or more than three years, more than three years, we can always re-challenge with the first line. So there are multiple factors for this, this case-to-case basis, actually. Yeah, Pritish, so what will be the goal of treating such patients? So eight years, disease under uh, good control, though not disease-free, but disease under good control. So now he requires treatment. So now, as Priyanka said, Somi said, we have done those days. So what is your goal now? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, 
sir at this age at least we have to um, the, the at least the goal should be a comfortable life that is uh, a <laughs> Uh, with treatment which have less complications, patient should be ambulatory, patient uh, should have to uh, visit uh, hospital less often. So this this things should be taken into account at this age. Right. But the quality of life overall, the quality of life should be the goal. Right. So Priyanka, so now, so who are the candidates for the purine analogs? Any subset of CLL patients? PPLL. Pardon me? TL. PPLL. PPLL, sir. We don't have anything else except talentizumab for those patients if they relapse with bendamustin single agent or CHOP single agent. So, who are the candidates for maintenance therapy in CLL today? Priyanka. Sir, uh, sir Ibrutinib itself is a drug which uh, keeps on going on and on. So, it is in the form of maintenance only. But if I give a definitive therapy like Vendamustin, Rituximab or FCR, there is no role of maintenance anymore. We just stop at six cycles, whatever be the response, even if it is a PR, that is a good response, considered to be a good response. And the, uh, we wait for till the patient is again symptomatic with the disease. So, Somya, so your patient has received that chem definite yes. chemoimmunotherapy. Yes. So, any role of maintenance? So, uh, patients who, who have received the uh, BR regimen, so patients can be considered for maintenance, but right now um, patients can be on rituximab maintenance, the patient can be on obnidizumab, uh, obnidizumab can be continued. So, mostly patients who are on ibrutinib, they are itself on maintenance. So, no, 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 this, is, this is a chemo immunotherapy. So, we are not yeah. talking about the BTK here. Yeah. So, yeah. Pitish, Pitish, so, oh, sir, no, sir, as of now, I don't prefer any maintenance. So, this is the NCCN 2021. Just read the last one. Post first time chemo immunotherapy maintenance therapy, consider linanomide for those who are high risk patients. So, MRD, you can see with unmutated IGHB after first-line therapy. So you have shown that same slide, Priyanka? Yes, sir. So this is- but I didn't get robust, yeah. I didn't get sir, robust data regarding uh, this uh, lenalidomide maintenance, but it was definitely mentioned over there. And uh, to tell over here is also that, sir, for lenalidomide, they have not mentioned even the dosage, how much to give in these high-risk patients. But we do not practice it, and it is in the NCCN only. ESMO guidelines do not mention about any maintenance therapy. So even if MRD for that, PLL is still a question. For, uh, yeah, so even if you see the, again, 2021, in the relapse setting, for those post-second-line chemoimmunotherapy maintenance therapy, for those who had complete or a partial response, as Sony was saying, after relapse or refractory, uh, so linalidomide and second is the anti-C20, uh, so rituximab is not there in the whole, uh, if you see the guidelines. So opatumab, though that is a category 2B. So these are from the recent uh, NCC in 2021. So we have talked that, so, so the first generation and second generation are different and Priyanka rightly said that there are off-level off activity much more in the ibrutinib as compared to, so acalotumib. Uh, so, is a less off target inhibitions. Again, this slide has been shown by Priyanka. So, these are few of the slides which I have taken from one of the talks from Anthony Matto. So, all of you can go through. So, the beautiful summary. So, application to clinical practice strategies for selecting the optimal BTKI. So, currently, two BTKI are approved in CLL. So, ibrutinib with or without rituximab or obinitumab. Second is the acarotumab with or without obinitumab. In favor of ibrutinib is longer term follow up now up to eight years. A robust portfolio of phase three studies comparing against a robust chemoimmunotherapy regimen. So, more data in deletion 17P and T53 mutation patients. So, <coughs> as compared to, so we cannot, so, so maybe once this acalorbotum is available to us, so we should not forget even uh, this is available at a lower cost with us because. It has an eight years follow up now and more data in deletion 17P and TP53 TP as compared to the, the second generation. What is in favor of this, the, the second generation is a potentially improved safety profile, both in terms of non serious side effects 
and possibly cardiac events comparable efficacy data as ibrutinib though with shorter follow up positive head to head data with versus more robust comparison in the uh, recurrent setting when to use anti c20 with ibrutinib no pfs benefit to adding rituximab but can be useful in patients with immune mediated cytopenias unknown pfs benefit to adding obentuzumab so generally not indicated according to that pfs benefit to adding obentuzumab but no os benefit so pros and cons can be discussed with individual patients so this is a btk as a front line cll treatment so there are many patients because they had to be withdrawn because of adverse events so up to 20% of patients discontinue ibrutinib due to adverse events so one out of five five so when these patients are a long term treatment and with an advancing age so in the real world data if you see so so one out of five actually will go out of uh, because of because of toxicities and and the other group because of resistance so next generation btk have a similar efficacy as ibrutinib but possibly greater tolerability reversible btk inhibitors in development may overcome resistance mutations so, so how to best organizing organize the task of sequencing therapy consideration of prior therapies that like btk exposed patients benetoclax exposed patients pi3k exposed patient consideration of reasons for discontinuation completion of planned therapy because of suppose one year of therapy in benetoclax only progression of disease known or unknown resistance mechanism actions intolerance or adverse event especially with ibrutinib consideration of levels of evidence so now priyanka any thoughts on sequencing of these drugs in uh, once you are starting these patients on a front line therapy based upon the uh, presence of the pp53 mutation or the ighv mutation uh, we start with the bruton kinase inhibitors first line benetoclax and rituximab can be considered but i would first go with uh, bruton kinase inhibitor because it is available with us and uh, if the patient has already been exposed to bruton kinase and he is either intolerable or progressed with bruton kinase then we switch over to benetoclax and regarding the uh, phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase inhibitors the idelalisib and all the response rate with idelalisib is poor 30% hardly overall response rate and uh, tolerability issue are much higher than those with the bruton kinase inhibitors so at present bruton kinase inhibitors first line followed by benetoclax and uh, rituximab and still further with the chlorambucil i would not even uh, till now also not say that chlorambucil is a drug which has been completely out because there are affordability issues and it has been a good drug before these drugs were available but priyanka before the affordability the, the availability of the drug itself is a problem so you may not get the drug so that is the whole problem like <laughs> like many times the oral milfelan and the chlorambucil no so many yes, times sir. you ask the n number of um, the yes, pharmacy sir. Yes, sir. it is not available yes. so prithish so now so most of the patients will be starting on btk inhibitors so for some reasons toxicities or a clinical not responding patient on a btk inhibitors then how how do you choose your second line treatment yes sir uh, there is a different scenarios if the patient progresses while on ibrutinib then uh, we should not go for acalabrutinib and we should no, think no, no, about no. just just a minute prithish bruton kinase inhibitors they have specific mutations so you have to look at the mutations it is similar to like the way we treat with imatinib then so, we go uh, for the, the resistance to ibrutinib uh, usually depends upon various factors among them the mutation that is the uh, valin to uh, uh, the glycine to valin at 101 position i think that's the that commonest common. no common. but other mechanisms are also there uh, like uh, mcl and overexpression uh, and other things so but at this point of time whether to decide regarding the uh, the, the presence of mutation uh, is very questionable no guidelines are there to decide to do mutation first then to go, go for the mm -hmm. treatment um, like uh, changing to acalabrutinib so okay. at this point of time 
we have to think that if the patient progress if uh, progresses while on ibrutinib then chances of responding to acalabrutinib is very less in that case we can think about venetoclax with with rituximab and uh, if patient progresses after completion of therapy to ibrutinib then we can reach challenge the patient with that or even at that time in that point of time we have an option for ibrutinib uh, and venetoclax with, 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 with without rituximab and if patient discontinued ibrutinib only because of the toxicities then uh, we can uh, reuse the drug with some modifications of the dose or in that case we can uh, give acalabrutinib at that point of time so somia so now you see that all all these uh, fancy drugs or the newer drugs we have seen in that in the trial setting that is something different and the real world is something different so this slide shows you a real world data of ibrutinib here so this is not from so this is from united states around 600 patients 41% of the patient discontinue ibrutinib medicine uh, median follow up of 17 months median time to ibrutinib discontinuation was 7 months too early so median time of 6 months for patients who discontinue due to intolerance so toxicity was the most common reason for ibrutinib discontinuation in frontline and and relapse and repeat setting so is this not a concern so we are talking in one hand uh, this is a oral therapy and priyanka is saying it comes as a 10000 rupees priti says these patients can be followed up easily but 40% is is too high number no in the real world setting so what is your take on this so, so, so while giving the drugs ibrutinib we must be very careful about the toxicity part and the discontinuation rates we have to remember that the reasoned two trial also had discontinuation rates to the tune of 40% but when they divided the discontinuation rates the discontinuation rate was due to progression discontinuation rate was sometimes because of uh, uh, toxicity issues so we have to look at what is the cause of discontinuation so if you look at the side effect profile it is close to something like 18 to 20% and not the 40% and uh, the, we can always come down on the dose part So you wrote me the you wrote me the guidance. So okay, this forty percent is a real world data published. So yes. we are talking about twenty percent that was in a trial setting. So this yes. is a real world data which has been published. Yes. So yes, uh, yes, we agree to that that the uh, ibrutinib uh, is not that safe a drug as it seems to be. So we still need to see the atrial fibrillation part, the hemorrhage part, the arthralgia part, and also we have to always remember that there is lot of arthralgia and fatigue. So these are grade one and grade two which you do not. we we should not uh, discuss for the discontinuation part the discontinuation is mainly because of the atrial fibrillation or the bleeding or a major hemorrhage so yes other patients need to be kept on close watch uh, even if it is a oral drug so most common adverse event that leading to discontinuation was atrial fibrillation infection hematologic bleeding and pneumonitis and this slide shows some differences we have discussed already ibrutinib versus aclutinib in terms of cytopenias infections and the cardiac profiles so um, priyanka so last last word ibrutinib and covid 19 uh, lung infections or lung inflammation rather yes sir ibrutinib actually the way it has been uh, uh, used in the chronic graft versus host disease uh, similarly similarly 5 mg bd dose has been approved has been used not approved exactly it has been used in patients with covid 19 and it has been shown to have uh, decreased incidence of the complications of covid or the severity of the covid complications so uh, since it is a proton kinase inhibitor the it inhibits the even below downstream the jak2 inhibition also occurs so these are some of the drugs which have shown some amount of uh, uh, benefit or rather they have lessened the toxicities of uh, uh, covid 19 but these are all what do you say the drugs which are in uh, trials and they are the ones which have been uh, uh, shown to have some benefit but not uh, exactly to for the treatment of covid 19 patients so these patients what i will say is a cln patient having covid 19 patient is asymptomatic we do not need to stop ibrutinib therapy for those patients right right that was the right message right message so pritish so priyanka talked about covid 19 and ibrutinib that was first generation so So, what is your take on the second generation acalabrutinib in COVID-19? So, it has the same literature available. So, musical relaxation. <laughs> yes, that indication. We should have a dinner now. By this time, 
and sir uh, when practically speaking i don't have any data uh, so, regarding so the i found out literature of... so there are on ibrutinib also and the aclorbutinib also but there are few patients so as priyanka rightly said somebody who is stable covid 19 cll on ibrutinib or even the the second generation drug so they need to be continued so it should not be in a yes so that's a good message for all so thank you somya priyanka pritish and uh, yeah the uh, thank you to you to have a mind blowing session tumhara session mein cll kaha se solid tumor wala hum ka so humko to aap se zyada padhai mil gaya Sorry, and uh, for this when I was studying, I came to know that the uh, ECOG trial, ECOG 1912 trial, uh, shows that even uh, ibrutinib rituximab in younger patient has a better res- uh, better uh, results than FCR, as Madam has shown. That is a new thing for me to know. No, no, that is why actually they have come up as a front line. You see, FCR has gone down now. Yes, yes, exactly. The only advantage is definite therapy for six months only. FCR is that is why a very good and MRP, MRP negative. Yes. So thank you, friends. Thank you. Stay safe. Covid nineteen second wave. We have already seen every day, every in and out. So so be safe and we continue to see each other at least or webinar or a physical meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Ayu. Thank you so much. Yanasam, Yanasam, Biswas sir, thank you so much, everyone, to all doctors who have given a valuable information yeah. to all of us. Why? Uh, it's been a great session to all of us, sir. Uh, with this, we can close. Hope uh, vote of thanks has been completed by Doctor Yanasam Biswas. Am I correct, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, yeah, yes. Done. Thank you so much, sir, and thank you so much, everyone. If if the participants wants to. Uh, Check the particular session one more time. They can go through with our Indian Oncology IAO YouTube link. Thank you so much one more time, everyone. Uh, have a good day. Stay safe. Please be maintain the social distancing for this COVID nineteen. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, sir.